So first, we're going to listen to this six-minute six speed dating thing, and then have some live. Oh, I'm Kim Solis. I am professor of pathology. I teach a course on technology and the future of medicine. And I put together this list of the 24 big challenges of humanity that could be addressed by AI, fixed by AI, helping humanity. And you may wonder how I came to do something like this. And it has to do with the BAMF classification, which I created 32 years ago. And you may also know that the University of Alberta ranks sixth in the world in transplantation. And the reason for that has to do with the literature's citations largely for the BAMF classification and the meetings that are held every two years. That's the reason we rank sixth. And that has engaged me then in generating worldwide consensus the past 32 years. And you can't do that without cutting edge technology. So that's where my interest in AI came from. So I, I'm now going to tell you a little bit more about the Bletchley Park AI safety meeting and the role that I had in preparing for the meeting. So it steps along the road to paradise engineering for the larger conception of health with AI, gene editing, and humor. Is too much health optimization dysphoric and undesirable? So at that Bletchley Park meeting, I was really quite amazed that I was able to provide input. And what I'm seeking now is medical students with strong maternal nurturing instincts to help with a communication challenge of this work of setting the goal for the future with the co-evolution of humanity and AI. How should that work? What should we aim for? And what I argued at the time of the Bletchley Park meeting, November 1st and 2nd, was a near Star Trek world, something like the world you see on Star Trek, but with everybody included. If you were to instantly create a Star Trek world today, a lot of the people you see around you wouldn't end up on the ship, right? So we need to make a more equitable world. But I was very proud to be able to provide that future vision. It was the most robust, positive view of the AI future presented. And then I was quite amazed just a week later on November 9th, when I was teaching with Rich Sutton in the Technology and Future of Medicine course that he proposed worlds even better. I was talking about a world optimized for what humans need and want with AI in charge. And he told me a much better world would be a completely automatic world with no one in charge optimized for what humans want and need. And maybe something like a jungle or coral reef, a really robust uh, enterprise. And then there was David Pierce. David Pierce also teaches in the course. He's a philosopher from the UK. And he talks about a world we've completely eliminated suffering, eliminated the need for animals to kill other animals, and a biohappiness revolution, which he has this six-minute video on which he's making into a two-hour movie. And then he points out that the 1946 World Health Organization Constitution has the following statement, which very much supports his ideas about getting rid of suffering. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And that statement, I think, maybe if we succeed in raising the profile, the issues I'm talking about right now, it may well be that the WHO decides to modify their constitution so it's not used as, as, as evidence in favor of such genetic manipulation. Because some of that proposed change seems to me dysphoric and probably undesirable. So beyond a certain point, maybe optimizing health beyond that point is not good. Happiness is more than the absence of suffering, where would it come from? Would not constant bliss states distract from other productive work? Yeah, I'm not sure how that gradient of bliss would work. Wouldn't it be odd to always be feeling so good when internally you knew that 
maybe you shouldn't be feeling so good, right? Yeah, so depictions of designs and gene-edited world and wilderness states with and without predators are just too unfamiliar to be appealing or credible. It's unclear how one would willingly enter into such a world where evolution takes place by design rather than by biological reproduction, and how one would be able to accept the loss of the pleasurable elements that are missing in such a world. Seems like clinical trials with informed consent would be required and no one would want to be the subject in such experiments. A completely automatic, optimized world which needs supervision until finally it doesn't. Is that a utopia or apocalypse? What would be the motivation for continuing to show up and come to work and go outside in such a world or would people just stay home and veg out? So I'll be asking the medical students working with me to decide which stepping stone in this march toward an AI future they wish to stop at for now. They just need to say, take the investigations this far and no farther for now to this point of temporary perfection. There are many steps toward AI nirvana for humanity. The steps are not all in a straight line toward a goal, some are side meanderings. The student doesn't have to choose the farthest step, or the step in the straightest line, just a step that is practical to end on for now. And the reason is why. That's plenty easy for them and informative for us and gives real profile then worldwide of what the medical students at the University of Alberta are helping us decide. Yeah, so that is the pitch. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a PowerPoint addition to that. <clears throat> So you may have wondered, well, what would we actually do? I mean, what does pick, picking the, the step mean? And I think the only practical thing is to have graphics, right? And not just one. It, it's not that we're like we're aiming for that one graphic. That would be crazy because you can't put in a single picture all the facets. But I think if the students could come up with some logical sequence, this is like the concept that I had back in 2016, and this is the equitable Star Trek future, and so on and so forth, all the way to these unreasonable things of you know genetically altered um, situation where no humans can feel pain and they just are feeling happy all the time, varying degrees of happy, no matter what's going on, they're always happy. It just seems like, and, and then the complete automatic world and the world not supported by biological reproduction anymore, but by design. So every time you get a new generation, it's always better. Now, sometimes the kids are inferior to, to the parents, right? So sometimes you don't move ahead with each generation. But we know what our motivation is today. And I think it, it's really hard to figure out what it would be in these other worlds. You know, what would make you want to be a part of it? What, you know? So um, what I think is, that, like, if you think about the various graphics now, so the future and all that jazz is using poetry and music to kind of trick people into learning important things they might not sit still for a lecture on, right? And so this is one of the graphics that we use for that. And so it's sort of promoting pleasurable listening or sound. And then the future is female, right? I mean, that's the other thing it's kind of promoting, right? And then this promotes the idea that with AI in charge, it could be actually a more benign world than it is now. Maybe they could be kinder, more patient, and empathetic than humans are. 
maybe that um, you know they would understand us better than we understand ourselves and so a lot of things would be easier for them and then this graphic down here you see how you're following along these steps where there's some dangers and some choice to make because probably some dead ends and you know if you think you're heading up there there's some turns in the road that don't really go up there and so on yeah, so that, those, those were those graphics. And then, what about the graphic artist? I mean, are, are we just going to take random graphics from all sorts of different people, different styles? Or are we going to get one graphic artist who could also be a medical resident or a medical student? to redraw everything so it all matches. Well, I think we ought to do both, right? That's what Peter Diamandis says. If you have a choice between two desirable paths, do both. But we obviously can't do them both at the same time. So we would have the graphics that, that we're deciding to use to represent these various attributes of, of, of this future positive vision that we're aiming toward. But to sell that to the world, we have matching graphics, right, that are pleasing and look like they, they, they came from the same source. So over time, we could do that. One of the things that the medical students would do is help us figure out how that's going to work and who should do the final graphics and all that kind of thing. But, but we would do both of those things. Um, and my kidney-oriented world, a lot of the things that I do have to do with kidney medicine, kidney pathology, it would be nice to bring that together with these other more general worlds. And this um, time is kidney graphic sort of does that in that it, it's a very general concept. Many patients with chronic kidney disease, you can draw a line, and there's hardly anything you can do which will alter the fact that their kidney function just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, generally in a pretty straight line. And so that's what I mean by time is kidney, that the longer you wait, the worse their kidney function is going to be. So at a certain time, they're going to need either dialysis or renal transplant in order to survive. But the exciting thing is we have now found some patients who seem to be getting better. They've got chronic kidney disease, but their renal function is, is improving. It would be nice to know how, how that works and if we can make that happen more often. So. These are the graphics that represent the uh, uh, Bletchley Park AI Safety Summit. And there are going to be other high profile uh, governmental meetings like that in 2024, first in South Korea and then in France. And so that gives us really something to aim for, to have our activities contribute to the preparation of those two other AI safety meetings. And then these are some of the other graphics we've been using for the positive future. Back in 2016, we started using this robot and child, or robot and uh, little girl graphic for the future and all that jazz, the idea of all the positive things you can do with poetry and music. And this is the most common graphic I, I use on Zoom. It's celebrate together. And during COVID, it didn't make any sense, but now we can use it again with people so close together. This is a, a depiction a depiction of an equitable Star Trek world. And this um, University of Montreal medical resident, Chin Yin Wong, did that picture of me and the robotic dog 
And then these swatches are ineffable content, right? I mean, there are lots of important things now that you can't put a name on, but it's still, still important. Like, you know, the, the things that involve muscle memory and so on are a little bit like that. When you catch a ball in the outfield, you're not calculating things. There are no words. It's just you know what to do, right? So probably this ineffable content will be more and more things like that over time. And we, we need to factor that in. And finally, this is historically a very interesting graphic. Ashita Mogi created this picture of the basic goodness of human beings three years ago. And uh, Rich Sutton that year talked me out of this idea, said, no, humans don't have such a thing as basic goodness. They can cooperate, machines can also cooperate, but there's nothing special about humans that, that it is the, um, the inherent goodness, the basic goodness of human beings. So, I think that he's both right and wrong. It, it's true that there's that, it, that you can't look at every human and say, I can find this basic goodness of human beings in you and in you. It's, it's always there. I, I don't know that it is always there, but I think it could always be. It's something we could aim for, and I think we, we, we should aim to have this be a sort of expectation that this is something humans have. Even if it needs to be learned, it needs to be built somehow. I, I still think that it's worth talking about. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. And I wonder whether you guys have any questions. Why don't I come over to the camera? And <laughs> Yeah, we can always edit out the last point if, part if you don't have anything. But if you do, yeah. So any questions, reaction, thoughts about I remember it? this picture on, our, on my interview when I first came in for the class. You showed this one to me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was so proud of it because it's a showstopper. On a, on a Zoom call, if you put that up, people are so amazed by it. I thought, wow, I've never seen such a, a, a highly effective picture in terms of altering human behavior. But then when Rich said something said it wasn't a real thing, I thought, oh no. But yeah, I think he's right that it's not always there, that there are lots of people, if you watch all their behavior, not a single moment that, that depicts a basic goodness of human beings. But on the other hand, other people have, have a lot of it, I think. So, so it, it's something that we should be working toward. And those figures aren't all human, I don't think. I, I think the one under the umbrella is an uh, alien of some sort, right? So it could even be you know, a um, uh, machine of some sort. But um, what I'm thinking is maybe the other graphics we haven't found or haven't created yet, they need to have people in them too, right? We, made, we need to make sure that people are part of this story. If you can't tell the story of the future without people because we don't want that. It's not that it's not possible to have a future without people, but it's not the future we want. Yeah, so, so we want to keep putting people in there. And th this is kind of like the ineffable content picture in that the blue and green stuff there, I, I think is an actual substance, right? That somehow there is a substance, this basic goodness. And, and, and that's what those people have. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know it just like stuck with me since like what three years ago. So yeah, yeah. So um, so anyway, um, any other thoughts? Uh, do you think I'm, I'm right that we should focus on the 
uh, graphics, you know, how we're going to sell this with the um, visuals. What other thoughts do you have about how, how we can sell this future vision? Because everywhere it's outnumbered by a huge quantity of um, negative uh, ideas about where where the future could be going. Well, yeah, I think, I think graphics are important because they also allow us to visualize the concept a little bit easier. I think people can identify more with an image than a bunch of words. Uh, additionally, I think it's important to highlight the positives for sure and the optimism with AI rather than just like the doom and gloom because when we think about designing AI and configuring AI, there's quite a bit that is still in human control and so instead of assuming that it will always go towards the, the bad, we can also take the assumption that we can configure it to operate in a more positive light and so yeah. if we think about it that way then perhaps it can promote like the promise of AI rather than the consequence of AI. So I think graphics also do a pretty good job of depicting that so I agree fully. Yeah, yeah. And in a way, t taking this course makes more sense now because of the, we seem to be very close to artificial general intelligence. Uh, the, the whole thing about Sam, Sam Altman getting fired as, as the CEO of OpenAI and then rehired, a few, it's like, seems to, to relate the fact to the fact that in last September, things happened internally that made them realize they're very, very close to uh, AGI. So, you know, when we've talked in this course about the technological singularity and the point when machines are smarter than we are, it seemed like a very distant thing. You know, who cares about something that that's, that is that far away? But now anybody who's used chat GPT is commonly getting the feeling that chat GPT knows a lot more than they do, right? And so we're all ready in that sort of phase, and, and then it, it, it can be broadened and uh, deepened so that you know, machines are more accurate. They, you know, hallucinate less and, and, and you know, gradually will we'll just get better and better. And they can self-improve a lot more quickly than we can. So suddenly the subject matter of this course seems relevant for everybody, you know, not, not, not just the few people who are interested in the long-range future. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. And, 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 thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having us.